denizens of the night. Welcome to another episode of the macabre, the terrifying. Broadcasting live from the margins of the scariest book you've ever read, I will be your guide through the witching hours. Tonight, we'll hear the chilling case of a quiet young boy and the man who stalks him. Our scene opens on an elementary school after classes have let out, where an anxious teacher is telling a young boy's father that someone they didn't recognize tried to pick up his son, Dylan. Those words alone should make you a little uneasy, but it gets worse. The man knew intimate details about Dylan, his birthday, the class he was in, and even his address. But, as always, Dylan remains quiet and distant, unable or unwilling to share the link between him and the man. This story is called Dylan's Diary and was written by Late But Still Early One. Someone we didn't know tried to pick Dylan up from school today, said his elementary school teacher. The guy said he was Dylan's older brother. Dylan doesn't have a brother, I said, alarmed. We thought so, too, replied the teacher. I suspected something wasn't right straight away. It was this tall, lanky guy with black hair. Looked in his late 30s, maybe even 40. He knew your address... Dylan's full name and birthday and which class he was in. I went inside to check with the principal. When I came back out, the guy was gone. I was silent for a second as I stood facing the teacher outside the school gate. The gate separated the main road and a large playground and basketball court leading into the school. All the other kids and parents had left, and we were the only ones standing inside. Where's Dylan now? I asked. He's waiting for you in the principal's office, she said, gesturing for me to follow as she turned around. I walked across the playground behind her shakily, then through the corridors to the office. My eight-year-old son Dylan sat on the couch in the principal's office, still as a stone. The principal sat behind her desk, and there was a cop standing next to her. Hey, buddy, I said. You okay? Dylan looked at me blankly. My Dylan was always a quiet boy. It was just the two of us at home at the time. I was a single dad. My late wife, Angie, Dylan's mother, died a year prior. She'd been hit by a car while cycling around a sharp bend, and they never identified the driver. I won't go into any more detail here, as frankly, I'd rather not relive that period. But safe to say, it destroyed me. I tried to pick up the pieces and stay strong for Dylan. Was I doing a good job? Only God knows. I received no feedback. Since then, Dylan became even more withdrawn, pretty much remaining silent until spoken to. He was seen by a child psychologist and various other members of the welfare team at school, but after assessment, they were sure he didn't have autism or the like. He could speak up when he was pressed, he was just shy and preferred to keep to himself. The cop confirmed I was Dylan's dad, then asked me a few questions. He finally told us they'd try and find the guy and to report if we ever saw him again. The principal and teacher said a few things. It was a blur. All I remember is sweating profusely with my knees shaking, trying to comprehend the fact that someone had tried to kidnap my son. Dylan, you didn't know that man, did you? Asked the principal. Dylan shook his head. I was on edge after that day. Dylan was my whole world, all the family I had left, and I couldn't stand the possibility that he could be in danger. It made me sick. Who was this bastard? Why my son? Did he know us or was it some random creep? 
I always walked Dylan to and from school thereafter and was never late to pick him up again. Meanwhile, Dylan himself didn't seem rattled in the slightest. He never mentioned the incident unless specifically asked. At the time, I thought he was just timid and didn't want to cause trouble. A couple of weeks later, after the incident, the same homeroom teacher called me during her lunch break. She said one of the kids in her class saw Dylan talking to a man through the school fence. When she rushed out, the man was gone. When Dylan was asked about it, he said he hadn't been talking to anyone. The girl who apparently spotted him was questioned further, and she was adamant she saw Dylan talking to a tall, lanky man with messy black hair. The cops were called again, did a quick search of the perimeter of the school, but they found no one suspicious. That afternoon, I sat Dylan down at the kitchen table. I won't get angry. I just need you to tell me the truth, I said, trying to steady my nerves. Did you or didn't you talk to a stranger today at school? Yes or no? He shrugged. Getting an answer out of him was harder than drawing blood from a stone. How many times have we told you not to talk to strangers? It's for your own safety. You do understand that, don't you, son? He nodded, looking slightly afraid. I realized I had raised my voice and felt guilty immediately. Exasperated and running on two hours of sleep, I left him at the dining table and went straight to bed. That night, I woke at 2 a.m. and went for a bathroom trip. I decided to check on Dylan while I was at it. He wasn't in his room. I called out his name and looked around in the living room and kitchen, getting more frantic as the seconds ticked by. I checked wardrobes, corners, even in cupboards which made no sense to look in as he'd never fit in them, but I was desperate, thinking he'd been kidnapped. I went out into the street, yelling his name as I ran up and down it like a maniac, to no avail. As I came back into the house ready to call the police, I looked in Dylan's room for one last check. He was sitting up on his bed, wide awake and staring back at me. Where were you? I asked, relieved but still alarmed. I was here, he replied. No, you weren't. I was looking everywhere for you and you weren't in here. I was. Had I imagined all of that? I shook my head, feeling a migraine coming on. Just stay in your room, okay? Don't scare me. I thought my eyes had deceived me somehow and the paranoia was getting to me. Perhaps I should have paid attention to the fact that the window was wide open. About a year after those incidents, I heard a knock at my apartment door. I was inside doing some paperwork while Dylan was in his room playing Minecraft. I was on alert immediately. No one ever knocked on the door. We lived in a block of apartments, and friends or acquaintances would always wait outside the main door, ring the doorbell, and I would greet them downstairs. This meant it was likely an upstairs or downstairs neighbor who needed something. I had a few of their numbers from when we moved in for contact should the need ever arise, but we weren't close at all. I wondered what could be the problem. I walked up to the door and looked outside the peephole. There was no one there. Odd, I thought. Perhaps I had heard something. Those random occurrences were commonplace now and second-guessing myself was just in my nature at that point. As I walked back to my desk in the living room, I heard another knock. Something was up. I walked up to the door again. No one seen through the peephole. Was someone pranking us? I stood just behind the door and texted my upstairs neighbor, asking him if he'd knocked on the door. A few moments later, I heard footsteps upstairs that went in the direction of the door, then hurriedly back into the apartment. I then received a text back about a minute later. Do not open the door. There's a guy with a huge knife crouching, hiding right next to your door. 
My phone buzzed again. Another text from my upstairs neighbor. Calling cops right now. Stay inside. I froze as all the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I was paralyzed for a few seconds. When I came to my senses, I tiptoed to Dylan's room. Stay inside. Keep quiet. I whispered, my eyes bulging, beads of sweat dripping down my forehead. I'd never felt my heart beat so fast. Dylan looked up and raised his eyebrows as I shut his door slowly and stood outside it, about to throw up and soil myself at the same time. We were so still that I could make out quiet but frantic talking upstairs and more rushing footsteps. I read my upstairs neighbor's texts again to make sure my eyes hadn't deceived me. I tiptoed to the kitchen and grabbed one of my own kitchen knives, then returned to the same spot outside Dylan's room, anticipating a crazed psycho busting down the door at any second. I chanted manic prayers for safety on repeat in my head. Not a sound came from inside his room. After what seemed like years, I heard sirens in the distance and my heart rate started to slow a little. My grip on the knife handle loosened. Eventually, I heard some shouting, more footsteps and banging that gradually faded in volume. This is the police, shouted a voice. I looked through the peephole to confirm that it was a cop, then opened the door, knife still in hand. They were very reassuring and informed us that a tall, lanky man with black hair had just been apprehended and taken into police custody. He had knocked on my door and was waiting for someone inside to open it. What was he going to do with it to the first person who opened that door, which was going to be me? Well, if it isn't obvious, then your guess is as good as mine. This guy's name was Gregory. He seemed to bounce around from place to place with no permanent address, even traveling between states and doing petty crimes like theft, harassment, and occasionally stalking minors. When they did a more thorough search, it turns out he had been involved in at least one gruesome murder in a different state and ended up being given a life sentence for it, along with his accomplices. I wouldn't have wished that terror upon anyone, but these unfortunate things happen. The side effects of the psychological damage I experienced that day have never left me. However, I know people who have been through similar horrors, but never lived to tell the tale, so I looked on the bright side and counted myself lucky. When there are sick freaks, there will be victims. The sicko was in jail, and I thought that was the end of it. But there was a different side to the story that I only uncovered 10 years after the incident. Dylan was due to leave for college, living away from home for the first time. He had grown into a tall kid with a surprising number of friends, still obedient but relentlessly quiet. While packing his things and clearing out his room, I found a rugged looking old notebook at the back of his bottom drawer. Dylan's diary, said the cover. I flicked through it with no intention to pry initially and saw that he had written and drawn in it extensively with impressively neat handwriting. He'd always been a boy of few words, so I was intrigued. I began reading from the first page. Page one. Cody's house, 11 a.m. He has to give me back my coat. There were a few stick figure drawings. Page two. I need a book for English class next week. Ask if Amy has one. I turned the pages, and the first few were filled with the same mundane elementary school day-to-day -day affairs mixed in with a few doodles. Then I got to page 21. Page 21. Why does my dad talk so much? He won't even let me get an Xbox, and he won't let me sleep over at Cody's house. Talking back is no use. I hate him. I felt a sting and my heart sank. I remembered that day vividly, and a pang of guilt ran through me. 
I turned the page. Page 22. Saw Greg today. He says he can help me get rid of Dad. I said he was lying, but he says he's done it before. It was in the news. As my mind connected the dots, I flicked through the previous pages. This was the first mention of Greg I could find. I started to sweat, but continued reading. Page 23. Me and Greg are coming up with a plan. Need Dad gone. But I almost got caught talking to him today. Mrs. Watford, that stupid old mole rat, kept asking me. She took me to the principal's office again. I think Katie saw Greg and snitched. Need to be careful. A few blank pages, with a few in between filled with scribbles and admin type notes to self. Then the narrative continued. Page 41. The word plan was underlined with two drawings underneath. The first was of a stick figure kneeling by a door holding what looked like a dagger. This stick figure was smiling. There was another stick figure behind the door with its hand on the door handle, about to open the door. The second was of the first stick figure stabbing the stick man who had just opened the door, his eyes now two crosses. Page 42. Greg came to my house and I showed him my plan. He said it was good and he could do it. We almost got caught by Dad, but I got back in bed just in time. He's going to get some tools from his house. Close one. Page 43. Greg screwed up. He's in jail now. Why did Dad not open the door when Greg knocked? Everything went wrong. I don't know why. Page 44. I wish my dad would just shut up. I flicked through the rest of the notebook, which was blank. Page 44 was the last entry. I read the entries a few times and pondered what I should do. I never thought Dylan was capable of such heinous intentions. Confused and upset, I acted as if nothing had happened for a few days, but on the day he was due to leave for college, I couldn't hold it in anymore. I brought his duffel bag down and hooked it on his suitcase. He was ready to head to the station, standing outside the door with the suitcase and his backpack. Dylan, um, when you were younger, did I ever say or do anything that hurt you? You can be honest with me. No, why do you ask? He replied. I held up the diary. He froze for a second, and I saw the color drain from his face. I won't blame you for anything. Don't worry. You know I love you very much, son. You were a minor, and you were a victim of a very sick man. Besides, this thing is years old. I just want to know what I did wrong at the time to lead to this, and we can put it behind us. His shocked expression faded, leaving his ever-present blank stare. You didn't do anything wrong. Neither did Mom. I opened my mouth to ask him what he meant by that, but stopped. The corners of his mouth stretched into a wide smile. Our eyes met, and we stood in silence for a few seconds. Dylan? If I were to find another one of these notebooks, I began tactfully. Would I see the blueprint of my wife's murder inside? Yeah. He didn't even pause to answer. Then he gripped the handle of his suitcase and walked off down the street. That was two years ago now. I never forgave him. Every night I still lie awake thinking whether he was born that way or it's somehow my fault. We haven't talked since he left that day and he hasn't come back home. He's never tried to contact me and I haven't likewise. It looks like he's doing well in college from his Facebook posts. He seems to have a lot of friends, so I assume he got his own place or stays with one of them. 
I wonder if any of them will ever find out who he really is. Wouldn't blame them if they never do. After all, I still don't know who my son is, and I raised him for 18 years. Well, well, well. I must really have a penchant for a good twist. I seem to be on something of a roll. Did you see this one coming? I didn't. There was a good use of literary sleight of hand. The reader is so focused on the man and the danger he presents, they forget the title of the whole thing is Dylan's Diary. So when the father finds the diary, we suddenly remember that the story is not over. And there's one more thread to pull. Have you ever seen the show Monster? It's an anime show based on a graphic novel of the same name. It follows Dr. Tenma, who pursues a young and talented sociopathic murderer named Johan as he slashes his way around Germany. It is an exceptionally good thriller, and if you enjoyed the premise of this story, you might also enjoy that show. As of this recording, it is available to watch on Netflix. Check it out and let me know what you think. If you enjoyed this story, please leave a like on this video and consider tossing tonight's author a few bucks in the donation link below. All your support of this channel and the authors who appear here is greatly appreciated, if somewhat understated. Consider subscribing if you'd like to hear more stories like this one. Whatever you do, consider if the danger might actually be inside the house. And don't fall asleep. <laughs>